my name is Dr. Olivia Moses and welcome to Wellness Live. We are so excited you have joined us here at Loma Linda University Health for this session um, in September 2021. Now, if you are watching us live, you will have the opportunity to ask questions of our presenter live in your chat box. So don't forget, we have an opportunity for us to interact live here. Well, I wanna introduce the topic here today. We are in 2021 and we've gone through a lot we have gone through covid we are still dealing with covid 19 and all of its friends when it comes to all of the variants however even on top of covid our other things in life didn't stop being a parent ha having a job aging you know all of those things continue to be built on top of that so I have a very special guest today to talk to us about resiliency. Now, resiliency is one of those topics that we all want to be resilient. And uh, Dr. Spencer Huang, who is an epidemiologist by trade and an associate professor here at Loma Linda University School of Public Health, has written a book just about this topic. And I thought she would be a perfect person to talk to us about how we, resiliency works and what we can do about it. Now, Dr. Spencer and I were in school together, so I can't tell you how excited I am that she is here today and talking to us about her book about resilience. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Dr. Spencer. Thank you, Dr. Moses, for introducing me. I'm so excited to be here today with you guys, and I'm going to share my screen. We're going to do this and share. And we're going to start from the beginning. Let's see. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about wisdom from the world's first resiliency capital for overcoming what life throws your way. And let me tell you, life is throwing a tremendous amount our way. And I wanted to start by kind of polling you, whether you put in the chat or just mental, take a mental note, I wanted to ask you guys some questions. So first is, how many of you are feeling stressed like you've never felt before, right? Whether recently, in the past few months, or in the past year. How many of you are feeling like the pace of life has hit the gas pedal, okay? How many of you fall asleep at night immediately when your head hits the pillow, right? You conk out or you have trouble staying asleep at night. How many of you are dealing with constant headaches or ulcers or any of those things? Or how many of you are now dealing with a chronic health condition, whether it's long-term COVID or high blood pressure or high cholesterol or you're caring for someone that has any of those conditions, okay? We have so many things that are thrown our way. It is unbelievable. We are really under a lot of stress lately, okay? And I can relate. This is kind of a picture of me about uh, five or six years ago. So I'm a mom. My youngest at that time is one years old. I have three kids, husband, career in public health. Everything is taking off at lightning speed. I'm dealing with chronic health conditions for my family, my kids, trying to manage all of this. I just felt like my life was on this roller coaster and I had a pounding headache and all of those conditions. I couldn't sleep at night, right? So all these things were crashing in on me. And this was not abundant life. In John 10, 10, Jesus says, I came that you may have life and have it in abundance. And when I looked at my life, I thought, this is terrible. I want to change. Okay. Um, and when I asked around many of my colleagues, psychologists, physicians, I'd ask them, and they were struggling the same way. It's more common than we realize. So one of the things I want to talk to you about is um, before we talk about kicking it to the curb, let's talk about what it is um, and where it comes from. And it might surprise you where it comes from, because some of the places that cause the stress, we don't even realize, right? We typically don't see them. Um, so from the public health perspective, stress is anything that, you know, constantly that you're exposed to or experiencing that want to take that wants to take your body away from this normal, this homeostasis. Right. And so here in Southern California, if you are living here, we have this every day. It's lovely smog or air pollution. This is one of the constant stressors we are exposed to causing harm to our body. Right. And it can be air pollution. It can be, um, you know, noise pollution, even light pollution. If you can't shut down from the, the, you know, lights all the time. We also have daily struggles. And let me tell you, these are becoming tremendous. And if you work in the healthcare setting, I know it must be immense with what is going on. So we have these daily struggles from job. If you're a student, 
right? I was in class with Dr. Moses a long time ago, and back then it was a lot on our plates, right? Struggling to get everything done. Financial, financial, maybe relationships in your life, daily struggles add to that stress in your life. Then we've got the virus or bacteria or whatever, whether you're exposed or now we're dealing with what we call secondary impacts where the virus may not have necessarily affected you, but around you, right? Maybe there's a death in the family um, so or shut down of schools or shut down of jobs, tremendous. And then we have this other box here, adverse childhood experiences. These are things in your childhood that scientists know is linked to harmful outcomes. Um, and they're things like divorce in the family or death in the family or abuse or, um, you know, on and on and on, the list goes on. These things by themselves are not great. They can cause harm on our body if left un un undeterred. And they're even worse in the fact that they interact with one another. They magnify their impact. And one way they do that is through inflammation, this chronic inflammation in your body, right? So left undeterred, chronic stress and inflammation, it's gonna rob us and it robs us of so much whether it's outcomes in, in daily activities, right? If you're chronically stressed, you're more likely to make mistakes on the job or mistakes in school or burnout. It affects our immune system, chronic disease. I mean, all of a lot of these are linked to all these chronic disease, huge list, relationships, happiness, and it deters us to even be able to fulfill our purpose in life. And let me tell you, society today, we're really good at treating these chronic conditions. We'll give you a medication, or we're going to give you an, a medical intervention. What we have a hard time doing is really addressing the stress that may have caused us to develop that in the first place, or it exacerbates that condition. And, and it also doesn't just affect adults. We see this affecting children already. They have this stress and, and causes problems in their life too. Our strategy, we need a comprehensive one, right? If we have from various angles, all these stressors, we really need to get a good handle and get a good intervention. And years ago, I thought, ah, the best place to go is gonna be with these key communities where they have enhanced resilience and they have longevity. And Job 12, 12 says, wisdom is with the age and understanding in length of days, okay? So where do we go where we know they have a lot, of, a lot of life, right? There's these regions around the world backed by science where people live significantly longer, okay? And here, Loma Linda has been identified as one, right? Um, the Adventist community, which is Christian faith community, primarily um, uh, like to, you know, eat more plant-based exercise, um, you know, and, and with that faith component. And we do see from studies, right, that it offsets disease. And guess what? increases longevity. So I got that. I understood that. I live here. I'm a mom, right? I knew I'm a research professor. I knew the biology of stress and I live in this community. So I thought, why not? Why not go and ask the people who live the longest what advice they would have for stress? Mind you, this was probably um, a divine seed planted because this happened long before COVID ever came around, right? So I went on this journey. And I, as a good researcher, I set out a research study, went through IRB, had my team of, um, of, of volunteers, and we went out to learn what is their childhood experiences, positive and negative, and of those, what did they carry across their life, right? What are those experiences, especially if that started in their childhood, okay? So here, I started with my great aunt, my husband's great aunt in this picture. I believe she's 101 here, and my youngest was one at the time. And my youngest actually stole the show. I couldn't get the centenary, my, my um, Mumu, to focus on me. She wanted to play with the baby. But here she was living independently at 101. At 100, she was still driving her own car to get her hair done on Friday, make sure she got to church on, on Saturday, right? So amazing. And she's reached 108 years of age, okay? Um, more and more, I started meeting the centenarians. This is this is um, Miss Anita Mackey, 105 years old here. Okay, and when I started meeting these guys, I realized they've lived abundant lives. These are people that have done amazing things, from record setters to groundbreaking surgeons. Um, uh, Miss Anita Mackey was a medical social worker, right? Even through through, through um, working at the VA, right? And so on and on, I started meeting these guys and realizing, wow, they have so much to share with us. 
And when I asked them where they were born, they were born all over the world, right? They weren't born here in Loma Linda. Um, many of them relocated later, but they were born all over the world. Okay, so here's where the rubber met the road. When I asked them the question, what hardships have you had in your life? Um, or what challenges did you have, especially in your childhood? And the centenarians would look at me and say, we've had none. And I would ask the question another way, thinking, oh, we don't remember. And then they would say, no, there's not much. But then when I got out of my mindset of the survey and the asking, and I said, okay, fine, just share about yourself. Oh, I about fell off the chair when they'd share. Time and time again, they went through all these storms. In fact, all of these food scarcity, loss of a parent, loss of a sibling, family separation, mental illness, addiction, witness to violence in the community, to pandemics, right? They've been through the 1918 Spanish flu. They had a minimum of four ACE score. And we know four ACEs like, is tremendously associated with adverse health outcomes. They're going to have chronic disease. And here they are, many of them, you know, at 108 years old, and, and they've been through this. This was my first shift in perspective, how they view the hardships that they were going through. Very different than if you were to ask me, what challenges do you, have, you or I have, right? I would, I, I would uh, list them off, but their perspective was very different. And then I asked them, I looked through to see what are those health benefits that might have afforded them protection. And I see these eight come out. And I probably won't have time to go through all eight, but a few of them I really want to point out. Time in nature, okay? I call this their keystone habit. It means a habit that's going to influence many other habits in their life. In fact, time in nature, it influenced the pace of their life. Many of these were farmers, not all, but many of them were farmers and they had to walk everywhere they wanted to go, right? So they spent a lot of time um, in nature. And one of the things I learned through studying these habits was every single one of these habits is linked with how your immune system works in some way or form. And these kind of habits, they interact with one another, okay? So they aren't just out in space by themselves with their own effect, right? They interact. Okay, so when I think about bringing it down home, right? Because eight sometimes is a hard number, we can't keep track. Four was the cornerstones that I came up with. And I call them your whole health ABCs. Okay, you're going to live daily, active, balanced, connected, and connected is to God and connected is to family and friends, right? And determined. So active, balanced, connected, and determined. This was the life that they were living. And I say it's more than a number. This was a lifestyle. They stacked these on top of one another and embedded in their life that they reached these and experienced these daily. I say no a la carte health, right? Today's society is so fast paced. We are encouraged to pick one or two and maybe on a few days of the week, right? And the centenarians, that wasn't the style. The style was living, active, balanced, connected, and determined daily. So at this point, I think I'll stop the share and see, open it up for any, if um, Dr. Moses has any questions or comments. Yes, thank you, Dr. Spencer. This is fantastic. And I think all this this pertains to just everybody, just everybody. I don't care where you are in the age bracket, centarian or not. I think we all can benefit from, you know, these messages. We do have a couple questions coming in. I want to just remind our viewers live, if you have any questions for Dr. Spencer, this is the time. So the first one is, what helps develop resiliency? So let's say I don't feel like I'm resilient. How is there anything I can actively do to get more? Yeah, we're going to talk. I'm going to give you guys some homework. And the homework today is going to, because no professor, no good professor won't let you leave without homework, right? So today I'm going to give you some um, tips and you're going to start and it's going to start to change um, your ability to start putting these into practice. And a big part of that is your time, right? You have 32,000 choices. An average human being a day has 32,000 choices you're faced with. And how many of those are you making with a resiliency mindset? Thinking of, you know, is that the choice I'd make versus is that the choice of convenience or speed or whatever, right? So it starts there, but stay tuned. Okay. The Another question that we have come in is how does nature impact our well being? Ah, this we'll talk about too at the end, but. Oh. Nature is one of the most 
powerful tools for healing, yet very underutilized, right? Because now our, our world, our society is really, you can see me in here, it's inside, indoors, shut off. Um, and so we are missing the value of the healing power, not only from the smell, to the visual, to the sights, to hearing the sounds. Even if you go outside, many of us, if we go for a jog or something, right, we'll wear headphones. So we're really shutting off. So I wanna encourage us to start um, when you go in nature to be observing and smelling, smelling and hearing um, and trying to experience it as most as you can. It would be very interesting because right now we are having this experience of the pandemic and it seems like we're inside more than ever before and almost scared to go outside. So this, I think, helps us to say we need to make it a point. Um, when it comes to our children, Dr. Spencer, is it as effective for them as well to start these processes early? Absolutely. The sooner you start to getting them out the doors and to doing these things, the easier it's going to become a part of their, their life and the more likely they are to use that as, as a tool to fight stress. The later on you start with wanting to get them outdoors, the, the greater the battle. It's still worth it, but um, we see even in children already, those that, are, um, that have suffered abuse, they already have this increasing level of inflammation already in childhood, right? And so the sooner you fight the stress and the inflammation in your life, the better it is um, but the greater the impact, not only even in immediate, like your schoolwork, your homework, right? But especially in the long term, you have a child that's having a hard time sitting still or focusing, go outside for a little bit and you'll be amazed when you come back in. Um, it's easier to redirect their attention. Mm, interesting. Another question that we have here is what indicators did you measure to determine resiliency of the participant? So this was a qualitative study. And after we got all the interviews, we transcribed them painstakingly, and then we coded them for themes across all the interviews, what's coming out. And so we had a team, we create code books, and then we look to see what are those positive themes that come out um, that we see, whether it's around diet, around sleep, around time in nature, all the things that we saw, um, that's how we did it. Okay. And let's get to one more before. How has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted resiliency in people? Oh, I think this has really tested us. This is like the storm. And one of the things is we are seeing, um, you know, many people, and, and it's very hard, very struggling, right, um, with, with, with anger and anxiety. I even encourage people when you're driving, be very careful right now because people are driving very angry and there's this kind of hostile feeling, right? So, and I get that, I understand that. But resiliency is about, yes, you're gonna be in a storm, just like the centenarians, but you're gonna have more peace. You're gonna be able to go through this and maintain, maintain your balance versus letting these storms pull you one way or another. It, that's not how we are meant to be. We're meant to be more grounded. Okay, wonderful. And I would assume spiritually has a play in that as well. Definitely, definitely. So why don't we get to the second half of your presentation? Thank you so much for taking some answers. And if you have not asked your questions, you'll have another uh, another time to do that right after uh, uh, the second half. Thank you. OK, let's go. OK. So one of the paradoxes I want you guys to consider, when I looked at all of this data coming in, I sat back and thought about what is it telling me, right? What are the centenarians telling me through their stories? Um, they had many aces. They've been through many hardships. They've been through pandemics and not just the 1918 Spanish through, they've been through many, right? And yet they've not only lived a resilient life, but an abundant long life. Um, this here is Ronaldo, right? Um, Lydia, one I wanted to point out here, Lydia is a centenarian knitting, um, she knits hats for the um, babies here in the, um, that have just delivered here, right? Knitting, knitting, uh, I think hundreds of hats a year um, to donate. Okay, so one of the things I want to um, focus on is a few key concepts. The first, they're genetically diverse, right? So if you think it's in the genes, the fact that they are every um, background, they came from all over the world, it's really a signal for the strength and the lifestyle factors, okay? 
And another thing to point out, another concept is these guys were poor. They should not have succeeded how they did. Um, they did not have uh, easy starts in life. Their families didn't have much resource, and yet they were able to overcome. And I want to point out that many of these lifestyle factors they experienced, they are little to no cost, right? Time in nature. Okay. They had a burden of ACEs. And we know that when you start to have these um, ACE scores, it's linked, to, it's linked to disease and life shortening. And here, one had an ACE score of six, and she's 108. And six ACE, a score of six or more, shortens your lifespan by 20 years. And now she's 108, right? Another signal for the lifestyle. And they've been through pandemics, right? So much for what we are experiencing today. In fact, this can look like our kids here, except that I don't think we, many of us own coats for children here in Southern California. Um, but this is, you know, what they went through. They know they, they blazed this trail before, but we have somewhat forgotten. Okay. Every single, when I started to look in the literature, I noticed every single one of these habits that they practice is linked to um, decreasing the inflammation in your body. And the wonderful thing about these is they have a synergistic positive effect. They interact to do even better. And when you lower that um, systemic chronic inflammation in your body, it lowers the um, risk of disease and increases survival. And it's really helpful um, for even um, slowing the aging process, right? And scientists are, are betting, or not betting, they're postulating, scientists, we postulate that the biological embedding of stress is through the inflammation that already starts in childhood. So it's important to already get these going. But if you don't, and you're already into midlife or later life, it's still great timing to already start to um, offset the stress in your life. We know that children already have this stress. Um, there's studies of abused kids and they already see this level of stress increasing. So it's really important um, to start as soon as possible. So in the end, when I sat back and realized what we had, I noticed it's not that our people, the Adventist community have lived longer. Um, that's, not the, that's not the amazing feat to me. That's amazing in itself, but even more was that they did so overcoming tremendous burden of hardships, pandemics, ACEs, right? So I said, they are really the first resiliency capital in the world. I think there are others. Um, maybe my next step is to go and, and um, interview overseas. But for now, the first one um, here, is, we are the first resiliency capital, okay? And the wonderful part of this is that there's a ripple effect. When you dampen the stress in your life and increased resilience in your body, it not only affects your overall health, but guess what? It's linked to increasing positive performance um, and even happiness. Because when you just feel better, right, you actually perform better. And also when you feel better, you're likely to, to increase happiness, right? So it goes beyond resilience. So the bottom line, right? The take home message here is, this is one of the first communities that shows signs. It's the first resiliency capital to be identified. And it's a, their lifestyle factors were dampening the inflammation in their body. Um, and it has implications. What we see here, if you put these into practice, you not only um, fight you know, the pandemic and the hardships of that, but many chronic stressors, even, even air quality here, right? And the damage air quality might do. The habits have positive synergy capability, which is really important. Remember the first slide I showed you, um, the stressors interact. So you wanna have a strategy that interacts in the positive to combat that interaction in the negative, right? So uh, um, equip yourself to withstand the storms. And we're gonna have a lot of storms. Once this pandemic goes, um, there will be more things to come. Right now we're dealing with measles outbreaks in other parts of the country, and I'm sure there will be many other um, challenges. So I said, strengthen yourself, get your bounce back, right? And it starts with a desire. You have to look and say, you know, um, that it's a desire you want to live like that. And for me, I knew I wanted a more abundant life, and so I started this journey. A big key is changing your pace, and I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. Readjusting your focus right? Really connecting with a faith foundation. That's important. Making informed steps. 
Remember I told you guys, 32,000 decisions a day, how many of those are informed by resiliency versus how many are just habit and you're going along? And remove the limits. Guess what? Hold a crooks. If you had told her she's going to hold world records as a mountaineering woman in her 90s, nearing 100, she probably wouldn't have believed you. She had no formal mountain training. She hiked in Nickel Hall, climbing the stairs to get her ability to climb mountains, right? And she's now a record holder and a centenarian. Okay, so your homework, because a good professor is going to give you guys take away what you're going to do. So it's going to start in the slowing. And part of that is to use the nature to slow yourself throughout the day. Okay. We have studies of patients in the hospital after surgery. The patients whose room views nature tend to get released sooner from the hospital than patients whose room views a brick wall, okay? Start to use that to help heal yourself and slow. I recommend going out or going to a window, some way to begin slowing and, and pausing for a moment to get that. Even Dr. Ellsworth Wareham, a cardiac surgeon, right? Um, lived to be a centenarian, he could mow his own lawn at 100 years in age. How many of us still mow our own lawn, okay? You might consider picking that up and doing that. Even though it seems like a chore, there's a benefit. And guess what? One of our centenarians, Hulda Crooks, when her husband passed away and even when he was health was declining, she used nature to heal herself and make it through. So with the hectic day-to-day, -day, I want to encourage you to start to slow that pace. And then also while you're slowing that pace, I call it the upstairs check-in, okay? That's checking in with God, right? No greater place for peace and reducing your stress than going to God. And you have to wait. Part of that is the pause. So even going to nature, the centenarians, when they had a problem, they would walk and walk and walk and often cry out to God and say, you know, I remember one centenarian say, her life was sunk. She didn't know what to do. She didn't have a career. Her friends were going off to college or were married. She wanted to go to college. And so she was crying out to God. Um, and then she was waiting. And guess what? She got accepted here, went to La Sierra University. And the funny thing about that, she never even applied. And her application said, not only did you not, we're happy to have you. And we have scholarship for you. A friend had applied for her. She didn't even know. So Isaiah 40, 31 says, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And we all need a lot of renewing of our strength. So start with evaluating your schedules. It's your metaphorical time closet. As you want to change what's in your time closet and move towards resilience, some things are in, some things are out. Look at your schedules. Are you happy with your plans? And are you living your purpose, right? And be aware, one of the one of the ways the world works is at increasing speed, increasing stress, and increasing disease because it becomes very hard for you to live your purpose, okay? And then the often unused tool to fight stress is here. Dr. Mildred Stilson is holding this, okay? It's scripture, right? And equipping yourself. Dr. Mildred Stilson is a centenarian, and she was one of seven women graduating the medical school class here at Loma Linda, so you can imagine the stress she went through. And then she's a pathologist trained, but went back to the mission field in Africa and sometimes would be the only physician in the, there at the clinic with her young daughter who was about seven years of age. And they'd have emergency surgeries to perform, the two of them, right? And so you can imagine the stress, but you have to uh, maintain that composure and not let it and not take it with you. Um, and so the often unused tool is what she's holding the Bible. In Philippians 4, 6 through 7, it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer, right? And thanksgiving, make your request be made known to God. So one of the things I recommend you guys do is, and if you if you want, I have scripture written, you can print them off and put them in your pocket, laminate them, put them in your pocket, or just have them in your pocket and feel them throughout the day. You can pull one new one out each day that you're at work, especially if you're in the hospital. And there's things you're going to have times when you'll be the only, maybe be the only nurse on the floor, right? With what's going on. So you want to guard yourself and you want to strengthen your resilience. I didn't have a lot of time to cover all the habits, but if you guys want more, I have a book that just published with um, Tyndale Publishing House, right? And it's available on Amazon or anywhere books are sold, Audible or um, a hard copy. And it summarizes all the research and the biology behind what the centenarians did, right? And it's in an eight-week program. And if you don't have any kids, that's fine. All you do is cross out the word kids and put adults. 
right? So you can raise resilience even in adults. It's great for you. The forward is written by the CDC. So I want to encourage you to start the journey. And additionally, I'm hoping to develop, I'm in the process of developing some workshops to help people um, because people are desperately needing to develop resilience. So if you're interested in either a workshop or you had questions that you didn't get answered, you guys can email me. In fact, um, I have these knitted hearts, right? Similar, and it says, um, just love for you, live every day resiliently. So first three people who email me, I'll, I'll mail you, right? And you can put this in your pocket and, and feel it throughout the day and remind yourself, right? Let your light shine, um, be brilliant. So my final thoughts are breakthroughs happen when limiting thoughts and modern daily habits are challenged. So my, my encouragement for you guys is live resiliently and live a breakthrough life. Thank you so much, Dr. Spencer. That was fantastic. We are going to get to a couple of, we have time for a few questions, and I think some of them are very practical. So I'm going to start with the practical questions first. Is there a dose response of how much time I need to spend in nature for the benefit to my resilience? How much time do I need? Well, the more daily you spend, the better, right? But even in, they have studies in Japan called forest bathing. So even when they went out and granted, they were kind of in a pine forest, even when they went out within 15 minutes and they swabbed their mouth for cortisol, it's a, a marker for stress. Within 15 minutes, their levels have dropped. Their blood pressure had dropped, their pulse rate had dropped. So the effect is pretty immediate. Um, granted, we don't live here in a forest, but I imagine um, even just getting out, you know, 30 minutes a day is gonna be beneficial. So what happens to the people who live in more of a kind of a city or urban atmosphere? Is it a park that they need or is it just getting out to be in the open air? It, are, are like, you know, abundance of trees and everything the important thing or can everyone, is this accessible to everybody? Yes, and the answer is yes. Um, I recommend even, even you can bring nature inside like what you have behind you, right? It's bringing in the real world um, inside, not just pretend, but like actual plants. Um, because they have biology going on that helps to take the pollutants out of the air. But if you don't have it by you, you can do potted plants on your patio, or you can take time and go to a nature um, on, you know, like on a Sabbath, on a Saturday, take that time and, and, you know, spend out in nature, right? Connecting, because it's not only connecting with the nature, it's spending time to connect with God to um, help to alleviate the centenarian stress. Perfect. We have another question that has come in that says, how can I maintain a positive attitude when everything seems to be going wrong? And I think we can all at some point in our life kind of commiserate with this person. Yes, yes. That's why you're going to have to really um, one of those the, the final cornerstone is determined and it's how you help yourself and how you help others. Right. That, and part of that is the mindset. We didn't have time to go over that all today. But part of that is that grounding and that um, faith component, right? And I also say, start, if you want to email me and get scriptures, I will send you, you print them off, cut them up and start carrying them with you and pulling them out. When you start to feel like that, you remind yourself of what the scriptures say. And when you start to feel your mind going that way, another thing you can do is stop and, and go out for a walk, head out to nature, doing what you can to break the cycle. Um, Holder Crook says, Sameness leads to madness, right? This is She wrote this in her book. So she says, break it up, get outdoors. Great. So in closing here, I want to ask a question, and I would assume this to be true, is that this, this kind of process or mind frame change is probably good to do as a couple or as a family or as friends or as a community in your church. It can be done by all of us, but sometimes having a partner in crime, so to speak, so makes the crime a lot easier. Um, is this something, how do we, um, what would you say about, is it better to do this solely for yourself or have partners? I mean, which one is more effective? It's definitely good. I mean, it depends on your own personality. If you don't find anybody that will partner with you, don't let that deter you. You go. Because what I saw with like one couple, 
Um, they were both um, physicians in the hospital well early on before the pandemic. And when the pandemic hit, they thanked me. The mom um, was a resident, started going through this with her young daughter who was four, and eventually the husband came along. But she didn't let it deter her. She became the light and then more will come. In fact, going through this may actually help you grow your village. So right now we have a real problem with um, disconnect. Um, and part of one of those C's is connecting with family and friends, right? Encouraging them, using them. And sometimes just your sharing of your struggles, you're going to be surprised how many others are going through this too and looking for a way. So I say good in numbers, grow your village, but don't let, if you don't have anybody, you go and you start too, and you're going to grow your village. So what, uh, if I'm hearing you correctly, what I'm hearing you say is that this personal journey it, has to happen regardless if you're doing with a group or not this personal journey has to happen for this to be effective so it just takes you one person to make the decision to start doing these kinds of things that's right especially if you're the only one in your household your household is relying on you to do this right and to get it and to start to go and eventually the others will come um, the children the younger they are the more pliable and, and this is a journey of a lifetime. Some days are going to be good and easier. And some days everything's going to go by the wayside. But you got to jump back in and start start again. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Spencer, for your time today. We were so excited to have you. And this is such a practical topic for all of us, especially right now, um, as we kind of are on this life journey together. So thank you so much. And I want to thank each of you, our viewers, for joining us as well. We are so excited that you have joined Loma Linda University Health on this journey toward wellness together. Please join us next month where we have another wonderful topic for you, um, or you can watch us on demand on YouTube. Thank you so much and have a wonderful, wonderful